Hello, I'm Damien Wetzel. Welcome. Um, more. Oh, just you wait. Just you wait. You'll get more. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this session with our Harman Eisner artist in residence, JR. Woo! So, JR, I was going to give you an endless, you know, introduction with lots of credits, but you know, the truth is, look at this. Come on. I mean, you've been on campus enough to have seen the work up close. For many of us, you know, we've gotten lucky, if we've been lucky, to see his work emerge uh, on the streets, basically. Suddenly, there they are. And then to have watched his career over the last decade plus, where he engages us and opens our eyes. And that really is a symbol so associated with him. And I know we'll talk about that a little bit, about what it is about the eyes. But suffice it to say, he's an artist in residence for us this year. He's here doing work with his inside out truck in the town here with Little Buck and myself on this stage, which you'll get to see a little later. Uh, and all in all, simply being a part of what is happening. That is the singular characteristic that I see. It's, these are crimes of opportunity, and they often are illegal, aren't they? Um, so Sometimes. without further ado, here is JR, please. Thank you. So, you know, it is said that you own the world's biggest art gallery. Uh, and that you discovered that you were an artist, and I think on your Instagram page you say, artist till you find a real job, or something like that. <laughs> yeah, if someone have a real job, actually, I'm still looking. You're ready. It could happen. Yeah. But, you know, the truth is you're dead serious about what you do. I mean, I watched you yesterday uh, pick up one of your, your plywood things and just start pushing it and getting people off a golf cart to help you, and it was kind of a whatever it's going to take to make it the way you want it is what I saw. And in working with you on the piece that we did here, uh, I found that, you know, you have the eye of an artist and yet you're so kind of, it's going to be, it's going to work out. And yet you put yourself in very awkward positions, I imagine, in these projects, right? Yeah, I, I feel constantly. But that's when I feel it's right. When, when, I, when I know there's a big chance of failure, then it's right. That's how you know. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it, being comfortable is not something you're looking for. I mean, for. I love it, but, uh, but I love trying to walk in the edge, you know, right. just because as an artist, you can fail. You have the right to fail. So why not trying? And by trying to fail, you might success, actually. And I love walking that zone where you start something not knowing if it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, it becomes kind of a, a motto constantly. Going yeah. in places, sometimes I, I fly with the whole team and we're not even sure we're going to be able to touch one wall. But the adventure starts there. It starts the moment we say we're going there. That's sometimes yeah. the hardest part. It's fun. the scale of your ambition. I mean, that's it. You just think, I want to try, I'm going to try, and we'll, we'll adjust. You know? Always worth trying. Always worth trying. Well, so many of your projects have dealt with the eyes. So let's talk about the eyes for a moment. So, in, uh, in Rio de Janeiro, to celebrate the women, you took photographs of their eyes and you posted them on the roofs. What's the, what was the idea that led you there? Um, was that the first eyes? Or? Uh, it's the first time actually on Women Are Heroes project that I started sun, like cropping over the eyes because the house on the favelas were uh, 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 I mean horizontal like that, kind of a rectangle. So I had to crop in the image in my portraits. And I decided, well, if I have to crop, let me go to the eyes because... You know, we all know eyes are the windows of the soul, and slowly also it was a way, you know, the eye is the eye of someone, but at the same time it could be anybody. And what was beautiful there in that community is that everyone felt it was their eyes. And, and there was not like it's about that person, and there was no star. It's, it's, you have the sense of community that's coming. I was about to say, so it's a community feeling, but it comes from the fact that you, they were members of the community's eyes, but they took ownership themselves. Exactly. And did they feel proud of this in a way, do you think? Or recognized, you know? You know, I guess I've tried pasting photos in tons of places around the world, and uh, I realized one thing. I went to Sudan, and I went to Switzerland, and I went to, you know, Aspen and South France. I don't know, everywhere. Everywhere people is looking for dignity. That's something we all have in common. People love to call places, rich places, poor places, whatever. I see people everywhere. And... I've, you know, I've enjoyed walking all those places, and since I've started the Inside Out project that's now here in town, I realized that everybody want to put their photo out there. Now what's changing, depending on where they're from, is the meaning they put behind it. Some people do it for just a selfie, 
out of the ego, right. and it's fine. And some others do it to fight for democracy in other country. That's just, you know, depending of in which context they're living. Yeah, so le levels of symbolism really vary enormously from one thing to another. That seems to be, I mean, there's so many projects we could talk about, but I want to shift to the most recent in a way and talk about the work you've been doing on immigration. Uh, famously, last year you were allowed access to Ellis Island. Uh, maybe we can put up one image of that for now. Tell us about, you know, why Ellis Island, how Ellis Island, where does this come from? Um, you know, going in all those countries around the world, I've met a lot of people that, was, that were dreaming of, of, of traveling. You know, sometimes I'm like, I, I would dream to go to Europe, I would dream to live in, in America. And uh, at some point I started to realize, okay, you know, I'm also, I, I migrate to the US. We, we're all immigrants. And, and basically, when I heard that Ellis Island, that was so close from where I live in New York, were half of the island was completely abandoned and no one had walked in in a hundred years in that whole section of the island. It's like Ellis Island is two islands like that. One of the islands have never been touched. And I decided to go there and it took me four years to actually be able to walk. And all those photos you see were real kids and people that arrived there a hundred years ago. So you took the space and you took historical images? Yeah. And you reinstated them, essentially. Exactly. You put them back. The park gave me access to touch the walls, basically. And they became artwork that will stay there forever until the building disappears. Because they are in, uh, they call it unrestored, uh, you know, and they felt kind of abandoned. Everything is still there. They just put wood on the window and the space is, is really hunting, actually. You know, you do feel ghost there. And did you uh, investigate the, the people in the images a little bit, or did you yeah, choose what was, them by, how, how did it happen? What was uh, pretty interesting, the more I look at the archives, is that sometimes you would see the same people. Mm. I think photography at that time was not something really developed, and they, um, they had to stage some of those images. With real immigrants, but people were just coming from three months travel on a boat. They came down, you know, they didn't want to scare, their, scare them with cameras. So it was really hard to find photos. And sometimes I realized I, I was seeing the same person. Oh. So it was really interesting because that's the only trace we have from Ellis Island. And, you know, the underlying message, as you said a minute ago, is that everybody is looking for dignity. These people were coming here in many different ranges. Again, the symbolism of the eyes ranges from people who were coming through, knew where they were going, to people who were arriving with nothing and hoping nothing but hope. And it seems to me that you're saluting that that spirit here and to remind us, to remind us that this is how it happened. This is how this country was built. And this is how it will always happen also. People always travel with the hope of a better home, wherever they're going from. If it's from, you know, from Europe at the time to the US and from, you know, people coming now from Syria, Libya to Europe, that's the exact same. We always like migrate to a better place, depending of conditions now. The conditions have changed over the years. It was just interesting to see at the time how people were welcomed there. Because yeah. there were, you know, 12 million people went through Ellis Island. They would go through, that section is actually the hospital. It was one of the best hospitals in the world because they would see all kind of disease coming from around the world. And if you were put in quarantine, that's where you would end up. And sometimes that's why it was called Island of Tears or Island of Hope, because sometimes you had to go back. Yeah, they pulled you to quarantine and that was meaning you're going back, basically. You know, Interestingly, they, they, there was not that many people that, that, that went back uh, mm -hmm. uh, compared to the 12 million. So it's only like tens of thousands. So yeah. it's still a lot, but I mean, compared to all the people who came, they made it. And some, made, you know, the, the, the interesting thing when you, when you look at all those uh, uh, places is they didn't know. Uh, you would arrive there and you'd cry the whole way mm -hmm. and they would think you're crazy because your eyes are red and you would go in the, in the section with crazy people. So there was a lot of misunderstanding and the well, problem and of language, language barrier. Exactly. Yeah, of course. Yeah, incredibly, incredibly fascinating. And it seems like the haunting aspect is is touching. But you know the the searching part. Let me let me ask you. This is a big time of talk of immigration in this country, uh, with you know lots of lots of efforts to uh, find a path to citizenship for immigrants who are being kept in the shadows, which we're going to talk about more. Did, was that part of your thinking originally, to highlight in some way? Is, it, is there some political message, or is it more? You know, it, it, last year, actually, you know, through the Inside Out project, a lot of people use it for different reasons. Last year, a lot of people use it to show all the people that the truck went in tons of cities, and people who didn't have, that, that were 
I think you call them illegal aliens when they're here in the US and don't have paper. They use the photo booth to say we're here. But it was mixed with other people that had their papers, so you couldn't tell who had and who hadn't. And they started pissing all over the US their right. photos like that. I, I thought that was really brave. So you must have been they very, came out very of the pleased. shadow, basically. Yeah, coming out of the shadows. So just in case there's anybody who's somehow unaware of this, the Inside Out project is a photo truck that JR built, which gives the opportunity to have a large format photo of yourself printed on the spot. It's sitting outside in the parking lot. And then it gets pasted. And it gets pasted in various places. Here we're using some structures that we built. In town, they're, they're using places in town. But you've done this in, I mean, endless numbers of permutations, yeah? I mean, I, I haven't, but people did. People did. The beautiful yeah. part of it is, it's for years I've been doing this around the world. And then I realized, wait, if I switch the process and I let the people do it, where is it going to show up? Yeah. And so the truck doesn't go all around the world. Because the, the easiest way and the cheapest way to send it to people is they email us their photo and we ship it back to them. And for free, wherever they are. But the truck is the most magical thing because yeah. you just walk the street, you haven't even thought about participating into an art project. And here you go, a minute after you're there with a huge image of yourself. And then you really ask your, the question of, okay, what do I want to do with this? And should I, should I paste it with my friends, my family? Should I paste it uh, you know, at this corner or in my bedroom? Or, or should I, you know, where does it, where the photo would have a meaning, basically? Yeah. Well, it's an invitation to participate in a huge community project, essentially. And it's very, uh, it's clearly very enticing. I mean, people just <laughs> love to do it. Look at these people. So you- I call this project the ghost of Ellis Island because you do feel presence there when you, when you walk in. In, and you can visit it, by the way. It's, uh, when you, if you go through New York and try to plan it a bit ahead, through the website of Ellis Island, they, they call it the Hard Hat Tours. And you have to go with, you know, you have to see the waiver if the rock fell on you, then, you know, <laughs> too bad. But um, you actually go with Hard Hats and National Guards, and you're able to walk in this building, which I think is amazing. Because I, when I did it there, I thought that only those photographs would travel, but never anybody would be able to come in. And, and so just knowing that people are going there every day, just, uh, you know, the, the last beds. And look at those, look at those uh, leaves on the bed. I don't know how they got there because there's wood on the, on the windows. There's a lot of, uh, like, you know, unanswered questions. There's rooms that are deep cold where the next room is, you know, really warm. You don't understand. There's doors that are changing the next day you get there. Uh, it's, 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 you know, it's a place with a lot of energies. And it's all, they're just going to leave this now, what you've done. It's yeah. going to stay. So many families. And it's, you know, you're, you're surrounded by water all over. And, the, you know, New York is so close. You would imagine being there and having to go back where you were so close from getting there. Um, each time I, you know, walk down those stairs, uh, I mean, actually, some of those stairs doesn't exist, so you have to jump, <laughs> not to fall. But, uh, you know, I would look at the... At the, at the cityscape, and uh, and I would think that you know, how does people at that time just standing there in a room waiting for 40 days, not knowing if they would just get to those you know few miles to the other side? And this must have been the the locker rooms for the, the yeah. nurses who worked in the quarantine. We were talking yesterday about all the people that you know. When you start to think about this, you I'm sure you're doing the same thing. Who came through? Did I know people in my family from before? Do kind of so? There's a great thing you can go to the Ellis Island website and look it up. Yeah. Uh, so I was thinking about uh, George Balanchine, the founder of New York City Ballet, and we're going to talk about JR's connection to City Ballet in a minute, uh, but that was my company, and Balanchine came to the United States in 1933. So I immediately thought, what happened? I don't know this story. I don't know exactly what happened. Well, it turns out you can look it up, and it's George. He still has an S at the end. He's been fr uh, Francophiled. Uh, Francophoned, is that what you say? He made French? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and Balanchine, and he does go through. But he doesn't have to stop at Ellis Island at that point because by then it's only for quarantine. But he has a close call, and this is all, I, I found all this information out since we talked. Uh, he has a close call, and they think perhaps they need to send him back to quarantine, and his patrons in the United States at the last minute avert the, wow. the disaster. He's come all the way. They're on the boat, he doesn't get off, and they're standing on the dock waiting, and they think he has to go back, and they get him. So the connections are, are many, and I encourage you to look them up. Um, so that was just last year, right? Yeah. And there's going to be a film coming, if I'm correct. Yeah. Yes. So you can watch <laughs> for that, The Ghost of Ellis Island. But more recently, you did a project very related uh, on immigration with the New York Times. Um, let's talk about that. How does that happen? 
Because um, you're very picky about what you do. I mean. Yeah, but uh, um, you know the funny thing is, uh, and is that uh, 11 years ago, and that's uh, it's going to be the, the you know when we'll talk after about the film that we're going to show now. But um, 11 years ago, I did the cover of New York Times when there was the riots in France. But they didn't know my name or who I was. I was just my first posters up in the street, and they were in the background of the riots. So, so you it, were there. But I, I, it was yeah. interesting that ten years later or eleven years later, they asked me to build a cover for the magazine. But this time, we're, that we would walk together. And so when and they say we want to do something that have never been seen, and I say, wait, the nature of my walk is is that it's right there in the street. You can take photos. You can share it at the moment. I don't. You know, uh, there's no copyright. And um, so I said, we got to, you know, so for months I never replied. I was like, I'm sorry, you know, I don't see what we can do. So when I came back, when I came back to New York, they saw my Instagram when I was in New York. They said, oh, do you mind meeting the director? I said, sure, I'll pop up. So I come there and it's like, okay, so did they tell you, you know, we want to do? I say, yeah, you know, I'm going to tell you the same thing. I, I'm not going to create a, a walk that, you know, I'm going to hide from people. And then he said, okay, what I'll do, I'll just give you the titles of all the coming issues. And then if one rings a bell, you know, Let's see. And he said, all right, for example, next month, we have an issue called Walking New York. I'm like, oh, OK. When is that? Uh, they say it was 26th of April. I was like, oh, I'll be there. I said, OK, so wait. Um, I maybe have an idea. And we, I thought about an image that would be so big to the city that no one would see it. But then from a certain point of view, you couldn't miss it. So we worked on that. And it happened, I, actually, that collaboration happened in four weeks. That's it, from day one to then the moment it happened. So I said, well, I want to focus on immigration because that's, you know, I, I don't want to start a new project for the New York Times. So what I'm doing now is mainly in Ellis, in Ellis Island. He said, okay, why don't we focus on the people that arrive now? So we've been looking for people that just arrived in New York. Mm -hmm. And we found, you know, 150 person, but we, 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 we selected 25. And, uh, and they came to my studio, all of them. And, uh, you know, some spoke English, some didn't. They all just arrived. And, uh, and I took their photos. And, yeah. And uh, I printed their photo because they're kind of shadows in the city. So you can go through those. Uh, and uh, I would hide them behind. But the thing is, those ones were uh, in the magazine, but there was the address of the location where it would be pasted. But to see them you would have to go in the neighborhoods or around all the five boroughs the day the magazine come out. So I pasted all those uh, photos all around the city. And uh, so those ones you know, were the tiny one, and they were the story of each person inside. And then we walked on a slightly bigger one that, uh, as I told you, no one you know, could see, but literally would walk over all day. So that was in front of the flat iron plaza. And we pasted it all night. So from you know, 2 in the morning to 8, it was a beautiful day. People came with the ice creams. You know, there's Italy right there. There's tons of great places. And uh, all they were looking at is the flat iron, which is beautiful. And it's one of the most photographed buildings in, you know, in the world. That's what they told me. You know, I'm sure everybody says that about their building, but that's what they told me there. <laughs> And how can you verify anyway? But it's true. Everybody was there with their phone, walking on his face, walking on his arms, and just photographing the flat iron. Then I waited, because the, the funny thing here, you don't see any shadow, because there was just half hour where there was no shadow. There's tons of buildings around. Then maybe, you know, three, four hours after, I, I, I took a helicopter, and we flew above it. And then when I went above there, first I finally check if all those strips <laughs> connected, because that is hundreds of strips. That's how it pays, you know, it's strips, strips. So it's like a puzzle. So trust me, I was really stressed at 2 in the morning when you only have slept, you know, a couple hours, and you have to start somewhere, and you're like, wait, am I straight? Where is that going? And that's it. When you start, that's it. It's over. And, you know, it, it, it's kind of matching. So it had to not go over some tables. We moved the plans. All the taxi, everyone was really concerned. The taxi was like, what are you guys doing? I can't see anything of what you're doing. No, we're just putting grays, you know, lots of grays on the floor. And, um, and so he was in the shadow all day. But then when the cover came out, he was in the light and everyone else in the shadow. Incredible.
such a beautiful when I was When I was shooting up there, actually, there's a funny story. There was one guy laying down under his nose, and it looked like he had a mustache. <laughs> so I was like, I told the, the guys, like, wait, can I take my phone? I need to text someone. And I text a friend. I say, yo, can you move that guy under his nose? Because he's going he's gonna, to, you know, fuck the cover. And, and then he went into the guy, and the guy's like, what? He's like, look, there's someone in the sky who's trying to take a picture. Do you mind moving? <laughs> just don't worry about it. Just don't move. Worry, yeah, yeah, just do it. Just move. Oh my God, so good. All right, well, so this is a, a long journey uh, on, the, on the unseen, if you will. And to, in 2006, you began uh, uh, doing these large scale uh, pastings in the bourgeois neighborhoods of Paris. So, and that's led to, uh, you know, that has a, has a life. Mm -hmm. It continued to the point where last year uh, you were invited to do something, typically. Please come do something at New York City Ballet, at New York State Theater, my old company. And typically you said, well, maybe I want to do a little more <laughs> than just, you know, what you expect. Um, so you made a ballet using that theme, right? Yeah. So, yeah, last year I was invited into your world that I had no idea about. I've never saw a ballet before. I was like, all right, let me just fail doing ballet. I'm fine with it. I've never been before, so who knows? And, and so I went there and I... I made this incredible, you know, core of ballet that you know all them, you know, uh, and I, I saw amazing artists that could do anything with their body that, that were walking day and night. And I wanted to create a ballet. And uh, Peter Martins, the director, said, me, okay, you're gonna, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna do a ballet. Let's do it. Let's produce one. So I was, then I was like, okay, damn, I, I hope he said no. And um, I started walking, and the story I wanted to tell was kind of the story of how I started, because uh, I started in the suburbs of Paris. Uh, in, you know, 11 years ago, 12 years ago. And the first time I blew up pictures was my friend filming me in his neighborhood that's called Les Bosquets in the outskirts of Paris. And I was pasting out of photos. And then he was filming me and then the guy said, hey, why don't you take us in photo? And that's the day I take that photo of him holding his video camera like a weapon and other photos. And then we're like, oh, what should we do with those photos? And I was like, oh, you know, why, why don't we paste them on those buildings? No one cares about this neighborhood anyway. So we started plastering. That was the first time I enlarged really big the photo. And we asked all the people from the neighborhood to stay down the building so that the police couldn't stop us. And that's what happened. All night, police were like, oh, all right. Anyway, they're covering like, graffiti that stays fucked, the police. So they were happy with us pasting this. <laughs> and I covered you know, those buildings. At that time, we invited whoever wanted to come. And we did an opening. Of course, people were afraid to get there. And it was complicated, really hard, communicating all the way there. But throughout the year, because it went through internet, and it was the beginning also of like, there was no social media. So it's just a few websites and people, you know, someone from Germany would hear about it and say, how can I go there? I would always say, just go and tell the people in that neighborhood that's supposed to be one of the most dangerous neighborhood in France that you came to see the art. And no one were ever, you know, insulted or anything. They actually, the community took them and say, yo, this is our art. The city tried to take it down. And the city sued me, actually. That the moment, uh, 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 that I paste those photos, they sued me for, you know, violation of public Van vandalism. vandalism. Yeah. And I left the country for one year. That's actually when I started coming to the U.S. Because I was really afraid. That was the first time that it, the case became big and they didn't have my name. You know, they sued JR. So, you know, they, they, they're still searching. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I left. And, um, and a year after, so those posters were still there because the, the people in the neighborhood didn't let them take them down. But the riots happened in France. And I don't know if you remember the 2005 riots. That was the largest riot since the French Revolution. It never went that big. The two kids that were chased by the police and hid in an electric box and died there, that's what started the riots, that was at the corner of my photo. So the next day, cars burnings, my photos all over the media, all around the world, people calling me. First time I received emails from huge agency like Reuters or AFP, can you walk for, for us? We can't get in that neighborhood anymore. We need photos from the inside. You know, I was just doing art. I was a kid. I was like, wait, wait, you want me to do photo and then sell them to the press so that they can say whatever they want? No, I, I'm, I don't know. I, I, so I went there and I talked to my friends and the kids were coming to me with like long lens and they said, look, we just told that. They were trying to take a photo of us from far. They think we're animals in here. And I was like, well, I've never seen a lens like that. And I was like, well, what do you want me to do with that? I mean, it's, anyway, it's broken. And, and, and I, what, they tell, what they were telling is that they felt, you know, uh, observed, they, 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 they felt like animals in a cage. And I said, wait, okay, so if you have nothing to reproach yourself and you're not taking part of the, of the riots, let me take your portrait. I'm going to take your portrait and I'm going to be really close. The only lens I had at the time 
was a 28 millimeter. So I'm going to take it like this from you. So you know that I'm taking your photo, and I'm going to paste it. And on that photo, I'm going to write your age, your name, your building number. So you go from someone in the media that you can't recognize, that they always like blur their face, and suddenly there was this paranoia in Paris where everyone was afraid that the, city, the suburbs would come to the city and to the people that you can actually go and knock at their door. And I started, I called this project Portraits of a Generation. I started uh, pasting them all over Paris. Those were my first portraits. So that's how I started. And my friend was documenting the riots from the inside. And over those years, I kept walking there over the last 10 years. And we've watched that neighborhood completely changing. And they destroyed those buildings. They had to, they, they, there was hundreds of things that happened there after. And we kept on walking there with my friend. And my friend stayed there from the inside. And uh, I kept on filming him, you know, and what it meant for him to be from there and at the same time having to document what's happening there. And so that's the film I want to show you today. It's, it's throughout 10 years. It's 10 years of footage. And when I did the ballet at New York City Ballet, I told them over there, I said, you know, I did a ballet about the riots. And they were like, oh, yeah, well, well, you know, I guess we'll never see it. I was like, wait. You know, it's true, actually, a lot of people, I'm sure, you know, nobody here has seen it. You know, a ballet is great, but you never know. It, it's queen, it yeah. played for one week, 3,000 people every day, but then you don't know when they're going to play it again. So I was like, wait, wait, let me take all the dancers in that neighborhood. Ne never any movie have been shot there because it's too violent. I want to bring all the ballerina. I want to bring all the dancers, and I want them to perform that ballet in the streets. And then started the, uh, thank you. And that, that was just... Um, uh, uh, so like you're going to see. Last June, yeah. And actually, gonna I want to say, you know, this, yeah. this, you know, like all my projects, there's never any branding. There's never, you know, it's all constant self-financing. And, and two other people that helped this movie happen are in the room today. All they did is one day I sent them a photo and I said, look, I'm ready to sell this photo. If you help us now, I'm going to make this movie. They didn't even know what was the movie, but they haven't even seen the ballet. And they helped. So I want to thank them, you know, today. Uh, uh, Whoever, wherever they are, there's, you know, Caroline, Noah, Nancy, Steven. They're somewhere here. Thank you. So I think the last thing we should say is that, so we're connected by New York City Ballet and our, you know, the shared life in, within those walls, but also we're connected by the star of the movie or one of the stars. There's Lauren Lovett, who's this wonderful young ballerina who does the lead of the dancer, but then there's Little Buck. So, uh, and who, you know, we, uh, is our connection, yeah. I guess. Lil, uh, when I started doing the ballet there, and I was in the office of the director, he said, all right, so we're gonna, you can take the company, whoever you want. We have 80 dancers. How many you need? I was like, I don't know, like a lot. Uh, <laughs> and I said, wait, but can I just ask one question? And, you know, he's, he's a really, like, strong person. I was like, what? what, what? Like, I, there's one dancer I would love to bring. And he really looked at me with a face like, what do you know about dancing? You know, and it's, he's right. And at the time, I got really scared. And then I said, well, the dancer is Lil Buck, and his face just, oh, yeah, of course, Lil Buck. And I know it's because you introduced you know, him to, to, uh, uh, to, to Lil Buck, and, uh, and he said, yeah, sure, that would be incredible to have Lil Buck on our stage there. And then that's it, I called Lil Buck, he came, and we started walking through all that process together. And uh, so Lil Buck is an incredible dancer. I can't say how much we became great friends, and his, the way he share his, his art and his talent to people. I've seen him dancing around the world in tons of different places and taking him there in that neighborhood where he's interpreting Lodge that you'll see the guy holding his video camera. So he's the interpretation of Lodge uh, was true extraordinary. true citizen artist. Yeah, but and uh, you know, another, yeah, so let's do this. And uh, Buck is here, there's a little more to come after the film and so uh, please enjoy. Let Thank you. Stay.
It might seem crazy what I'm about to say. Sunshine, she's here. You can take a break. I'm a hot air balloon that could go to space. With the air, like I don't care, baby. By the way. So we have time for like five minutes of questions. If you guys want to do that, and we'll tell you about how we made this and you know all of that. Um, so we're gonna grab a few chairs, let Buck have a glass of water. Yeah, exactly. maybe. Here you go. That was awesome. <laughs> okay, we'll just come down to the light. We'll just sit near you guys. Can you come back? So. So this is the thing, when, when I spoke to JR about, you know, coming here, he's like, well, God, do something, you know, we just go and talk about stuff we already did, right? Wasn't that basically the conversation? We're downtown, and we're like, okay, well, what can we do? So we, uh, we talked about, you know, building on what had been done. So we build on, you know, uh, the photo project, we build on uh, Le Bosquet, and he said, can we bring Buck? I was like, yeah, Buck. Definitely, he's here all the time. You know, he's an artist in residence too. And then we got here, and we still weren't sure what we were doing even. And then it just developed the other night. It's just great, just so fun. But you know, it's first thing. First thing is that so that's Buck's eye. So that's his own eye that you're looking at. And so, and you know, that's just something so personal about that. That I mean. I don't know. What do you? How, how did you feel when he was like first taking your picture, and you knew that you were going to be part of, you know, be in? I don't know what you call it. Brought to life through something inanimate. Well, you know, Damien, I. Oh, don't you start that again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I catch my breath. So, um, yeah. It, I mean, it felt great. I never really. Well, actually, I was. I, I almost lied right there. I was a part of a project he did in New York. Not a project, but some illegal stuff he did. Never mind. Um, yeah, but um, just being pasted out here 
And just being a part of anything that JR is, you know, doing, I'm always supporting. And um, I don't know, it always feels weird when he's in your face taking a picture of your eye, but at the same time, you know the outcome and you know what it will do and the effect it will do to people who, you know, spectate his art. So. Yeah. Well, it's so interesting because to do this, you know, he had the piece of music that uh, followed the film. It's basically the film's just like the credit roll, right, basically. And he said, okay, so we can do that. And then he comes to me with this beautiful, unheard, uh, you know, recording of Farrell. Um, and that's just, just, we did that here. And again, extreme close-up is something that I was thinking about. Because we, we didn't even know how much room we had here. We were like, okay, so we're going to put him right against the screen and we're going to maybe put the, the image on him. And then uh, I was just an incredible, like two days ago when you brought that recording. What did you think? Does he know what's happening? <laughs> I mean, you know, the, um, the, 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 the musician that worked on that, this, this was a, a team effort to make that film happen. And, uh, and the music part was a big component. Uh, the Woodkid, uh, this French musician, composed the whole ballet. But then uh, Pharrell William was helping on the music uh, of another film I was doing. And then I decided to combine both. And one day I bring them both to my house and I say, how do you feel, guys, about working together on making this music. And, uh, and then Farrell said, all right, I'm down, but I think just out of uh, respect for each other, we should bring a third person that we give our yes. music to. And you gotta tell him how that came about in the beginning. <laughs> so before he named this next person, this last person who helped score the film, um, when uh, JR was told he was gonna do this, uh, the actual, just the ballet, not even the film, he, um, we were looking for music, you know? Before we thought, before, we well, had Wicked in mind already, but we were just looking for different options of music for the, uh, for the ballet. And he came to, uh, to Vegas to visit me when I was doing Cirque, and, um, and we were just going over this uh, ballet that we are going to do that he had an idea about, that he wanted to, uh, you know, do. And, um, in the hallway of the Yeah, we were in the hallway of the Mandalay Bay. I was like, um, I kind of cut, um, I wouldn't say cut class, but I cut work. Um, I was injured. So I could uh, have a, you know, so we can have that meeting. But, um, but yeah, we, was in this, we, we snuck in this hallway in Mandalay Bay, and we were talking about the ballet and um, talking about the music we wanted to use for, I mean, for it and um, the people we wanted to, you know, get to help us out with that. And, the, and he asked me, what, what's the first song that comes in mind when you, when you think of something you want to, you know, do to it? I just thought of Hans Zimmer. You know, time, uh, have you ever seen Inception? He... He scored that movie. He scored. He scored a lot of you know f uh, films that have very beautiful soundtracks to it. And um, I, I said that name, and I let him hear the music, and he was like, "Bro, this is perfect." But uh, so uh, we didn't end up using Hans Zimmer's music for the actual ballet. But I'll let Jr. finish this up. <laughs> and then and and then yeah, and then basically Farrell said, "I want to bring Hans Zimmer." I was like. <laughs> And I was like, yeah, sure, right? I mean, I'll talk to you the day I'll see him, you know, because the guy is, uh, is a legend. Why would he do an art project that's literally never going to bring any money? It's just going to, we're just going to screen everywhere we can, but that's all. And, uh, and one day, he's, I was actually, I was late to that meeting because I was in New York City Ballet fighting with the union. And he, Farrell texts me and say, I'm on your, <laughs> I know. Uh, and uh, he said, I'm on your couch at home, you know, in your living room with Hans Zimmer. Where are you? I was like, oh, that's the quickest time I've met 60th Street to downtown. I was there in like 20 minutes. And I came there sweating like little Buck is. And I just arrived and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, I said, oh, relax, it's okay. And, you know, and then I drink some water. It took me 10 minutes to like say a word. And he jumped on board that day and he, he scored that whole, because that's 80 musicians playing. The whole thing, yeah. Amazing. Well, if anybody have questions, I guess. Yeah, let's do some questions. So you raise your hand. There's two mics, and uh, we'll try and like be equitable. So right down here, we'll start right there. Um, everything in everything was amazing. Like point blank, amazing. I'm looking for like figurative things and symbolism of what most of the things meant, and. I don't necessarily want to like ruin it or know exactly what you intended, but kind of like, am I in the right ballpark? Or either of you, I want to answer. Um, sort of, what did the white ballerina, the ballerina dressed in white, represent? Was it like 
purity or resilience because she crawled away after what I assume was like a battle of different opinions or a battle of different ideologies. And she sort of bonded, but the man accidentally, I assume, killed her, which was sort of like, if you're trying to help something, you can actually endanger it, potentially. That's sort of what I saw. And then the eye at the end, I especially like when you like crumbled into yourself. And I, I took that as the things you see can sometimes traumatize you or break you down. But you sort of getting rid of it is like, OK, I see all these terrible things and it is happening. But I'm going to hold on to myself other than what's around me. So you know, is I, I love I love to think about this this piece as just a poem. That's the way I wrote it. So I, I, I can tell you actually what it meant to me, but I actually really love what it meant to you. So I'm not saying that the version I can give you now, if you want, is the version, because depending on where you're from or what's your story, you're going to read this differently. The way um, I, I wrote it was, and that's why they're filming each other, that he's, he's, he was playing large, that was filming the riots from the inside, that's why you see them, and she was a journalist from the other side. Now, you don't need to know that. That's how I wrote the ballet. So she was, that's why she was always behind what was played the police in, in that ballet. She was always behind. So if one day you, you see it again, she, you know, they're like Lil Burke, and that's what Lodge was doing, my friend, that I took that photo during the riots. And you can find those footage online. He was trying to stop the riots by, doing, by filming some people that were doing mediation, that was going at night and tell the youth to go back home. And because they were a bit older than those youths, you see some footage where they're like, he was filming kids, and those kids had rocks ready to throw at cops, and he was like, Yo, why are you doing that? And I say, oh, you know, we want to get hurt. We're tired of this. They like, go, oh, I'm filming you right now. What do you have to say? And I'm like, I don't know. I just, uh, you know, we got. So yeah, I'm filming. What do you have to say? No, I just, you know, fuck the police. I say, all right. So put those. <laughs> he say, put those rocks down. Get the fuck home. I know your, I know your parents. And you see those kids just putting their rocks down and getting home. And that's that's the, the that's the the only weapon they had at that time. And um, and on the other hand, it was really interesting to see the riots had it spread through the media. And they actually had to stop saying the numbers of cars on TV that was burning all those neighborhoods in France because the other neighborhoods were trying to top that. So the media was playing a huge role, and they had to really like censor all the numbers. And so the interesting thing is for me was that I'm not saying you know one is good or the other. It's just it was two, you know, two visions. And that's why on stage when they were dancing, they had their, their way of interpreting each other's moves, and they were getting close. And we were talking with journalists at that time, too. And on stage, the way it functioned at New York City Ballet is when he would put up his, his hand like that, you feel it again, and when he would switch, it would be a camera, and you would see the detail of her skin and eyes, like you saw a little bit here, on the screen behind them. That, but that, I, I made it on stage at New York City Ballet because I, you know, I sat pretty far, and I couldn't see the feet, and I wonder how it looks from close, and I wanted to share that that night. But, um, I put a lot of little symbol in that film. For example, the, when the, the rioters at the end mix with the, the, the police and they all form, you know, one eye. Uh, those are, one eye is Buck eye, the other eye is the, that girl Lauren eye. So the two visions. So the two visions are important, basically. Yeah, and, um, and as far as like the wardrobe and everything, it was just a symbol f for, for, uh, for me, uh, I, I can speak. It was a symbol of um, uh, both of us wearing white because we, we were like, like he said, I played Lodge. Lodge was like the person who, the camera was his weapon. So he didn't, you know, play a part in throwing rocks or anything and provoking the police. The camera was his weapon to, uh, to you know, stop, try to, you know, meet, try to calm it down. And um, so he stood out because of that in the riots. You know, he stood out a lot. He was the one with the camera. So, and, and the journalist stood out because she wanted to uh, catch the inside and wanted to know what, what was really going on, but she couldn't really go on the inside because, she don't, she don't know those grounds and it's not her territory and you know, she's just afraid of what could happen. And um, so that's why we both were white because we, we stand out from like the, the crowd that was doing everything and you can, and so you can really see like this character, this is the character, these are the characters that are, you know, yeah. in the movie. And, um, and as far as the, um, I didn't kill her. <laughs> if you thought I killed, I didn't kill her. Um, it, it was just a symbol of, um, if, you, if you've ever seen that, 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 um, that picture, or that portrait that he took of Lodge, his friend, when he was holding the camera. But he was holding the, the yeah. camera like this. And at the beginning of the film. Yeah, at the beginning of the film. And a lot of people really fall into the stereotype thinking it's a gun just because of, you know, the color of his skin or, the, or how the portrait looks. But if you really just look at the, at the 
picture, you'd know it. It, it was just right in your face, a camera. And um, that's kind of what that symbolized. It was like, we do the same things, but in different ways, you know? It's, 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 it's two different, you know, we have two different uh, ways of, you know, but we both, you know, understand each other. And that, and that, and that goes as far as that. Um, you see this connection between me and Lauren Lovett, me and this, um, this journalist, and it was a connection with JR and his work uh, that he did and the journalist that wanted uh, to use him because they both did kind of the same thing, but for different meanings. So you see us connect, but we never really, you never really see us really, you know, finish the connection. And that, that, that was what I got from the movie. So. <laughs> so we are, unfortunately, way out of time. So we're gonna do questions after, if you know what I mean. But do you want to show one last thing? Do you want to go for that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go for it. Are we good there? So this is a minute long. It's, it's one minute, really. You want to see this. This is something created here. Here we go. A lot of people missed it, and I hope you enjoy it. I'm not going to even talk. Just. <laughs> 